One of the songs that we sang just a second ago is, is very special to me. A, a Friday a week ago, uh, my phone uh, rang and it was, it said my mom, Ann L is my mom's name, it said Annel Barron. And uh, so I answered the phone and I said, uh, hey mom. And there was a man on the other end of my mom's phone that said, sir, could you tell me your name? And I went, well, bud, you're talking to me on my mom's phone. How about you tell me your name? And he said, my name is, is Sergeant Carl Davis with the Texas Highway Patrol. And my heart just sank. And he told me that my mom and dad had been involved in a, a terrible car accident. They were being transported to the hospital, separate ambulances, because both of their injuries were, were that serious. And Kim and I jumped in the car and started heading this way. And it, at one point, she reached over and she turned the radio on, and it was to a Christian station, and the song that was playing was You Are God Alone. And I started in my mind singing that chorus that said, in the good times and bad, you are on your throne. You are God alone. And somehow I kind of knew, all right, it's going to be all right, because God was on his, on his throne. That hit me like a freight train. Have you heard that expression before? Hit you like a freight train? Have you ever heard this expression? Hit you like a mattress? <laughs> that was the headline of a, of, of a story that CNN carried while I was in the hospital this past week. I, the news was on TV. And I was trying to kill time. This was, this was early in the morning. A young man named Aaron Wood uh, on the outskirts of Brisbane, Australia, was riding his motorcycle and was going through a tunnel, and of all things in front of him in that tunnel was a pickup with a mattress in the back. The mattress flew up and hit Aaron Wood on his motorcycle. And you'd think, hit you like a mattress? Yeah, but actually, it hit the ground, and, and when it did, it bounced and a portion of the mattress went between his front tire and the fender that goes over the front tire. And he was, he was able to steer his mattress, lodged in between his front tire and the fender. He was able to steer his motorcycle to a stop and get off. And what makes it even more, uh, for me, amazing is that that tunnel is full of security cameras. And every bit of it was caught on tape. The entire thing, they showed the story over and over in that picture, over and over because it was caught on videotape. Well, I want us to talk about something this morning that was not caught on videotape. In fact, when this story happened, there was no videotape. There was only eyewitnesses. And that's how things were verified in in this time that, that this situation occurred. Today I want us to talk about the supernatural appearances of Jesus Christ after his resurrection. Find in your copy of God's Word, the book of Matthew, and in particular find Matthew chapter 28. Matthew 28. The Bible contains about 12 different stories about what happened to Jesus after he was resurrected. We, we've kind of, uh, Easter has come and Easter has, has gone. And, and, and we, we were able to live uh, an exciting time through Easter. You did. You, you and I, together, we, Easter came and it was, it was a wonderful time. We had had stuff here that was wonderful. You had stuff with your families. I've enjoyed hearing about you spending time with your families. But, but what we celebrate at Easter, unfortunately, usually stays at Easter. What, what we celebrate when we celebrate the, the resurrected Lord, usually after Easter, we kind of go back into the whatever mode we were in before we started talking about the the, the resurrection of Jesus. What God has laid upon my heart is that that's not something to leave behind. 
The resurrection of Jesus is not something that, that, that we want to just visit once a year. So today, I want us to kind of develop the mindset that, that we're going to continue to celebrate the resurrected Lord throughout this entire year. That we're not going to leave it, that what happens at Easter stays at Easter. We're going to keep it fresh on our mind. And so today, I want us to, to read about one of the 12 different appearances that Jesus had after he came out of that tomb. Matthew chapter 28, 28. Friends, there's not another book in the world like the one you're holding. Would you stand as I read aloud for us just verses 9 and 10 from Matthew chapter 28 at one of the stories about Jesus after he was resurrected. Look at your copy of God's Word or on the screen behind me. Matthew 28, and I'm going to start reading this verse 9. If you're there, say, I'm there. Look at verse 9. And as the ladies went, Jesus met them and greeted them. And they ran to him and they grasped his feet. That is underlined in my Bible. It's the only thing that has an underline in my, on that entire page of my Bible is they grasped his feet. That's, that's important. Keep reading. And they worshiped him. Then, verse 10, Jesus said to them, don't be afraid. Go and tell my brothers to leave for Galilee, and they will see me there. Pray with me, would you? Father, I do pray that as we study this story about Jesus appearing after he left that tomb, and I pray that Jesus will be so real in our lives that we can't help but, but do what these people did. And I pray it in Jesus' name, amen and amen. Thank you and be seated. And keep your copy open of God's Word. And this will be a great time if you like to underline in your Bible and those three words, grasp his feet, are not underlined to underline them. And the reason that I'm drawing so much attention to that is because the setting is this is after Jesus hung on a cross, died, was taken off the cross, put in a tomb to which no one had ever been buried in, had a, a stone rolled in front of it with a Roman seal put on it for these ladies to go there on that first Easter morning, that Sunday morning, find the stone rolled away, go in and see that Jesus wasn't there. And, and I know some of you are looking at me like, Donnie, what, why are you emphasizing grasp his feet? Well, I'm emphasizing grab his feet because of this. You don't grasp the feet of a ghost. You don't grasp the feet of, of an, a, 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 a hallucination. You don't grasp the feet of a vision. You grasp the feet of a person. A real body person not a dream these ladies weren't in some hypnotic state and they they think they saw Jesus and they fell and they grasped air God's word never misleads us God's word never lies God's word is literal and it is to be read literal so when I read that they fell and they grasped his feet I have to believe with all my heart that, that they're grabbing a real person. That's not the only time that this real person of Jesus was seen. J Jesus was seen by, by Mary Magdalene first at the tomb. She didn't know who, he was, who she was speaking to, and then her eyes were open. Two disciples on the road to Emmaus, they saw Jesus. Peter, when he was in Jerusalem, he saw Jesus. He appeared to the disciples one night, and Thomas wasn't there. Jesus all of a sudden was in the, the upper room with them, and Thomas wasn't there. And do you remember what, what Thomas said when all the disciples said, dude, you should have been there. You picked a bad time to miss church. And Thomas said, no, I'm not going to believe it until I, what? Touch 
Guess what happened one week later? You don't touch a ghost. You don't touch a dream. You don't touch a, a hallucination. You touch a body. And Jesus looked at Peter when he appeared to him that side, and he said, all right, here you go. Touch it. And it showed him his side. It, stick your hand in it. Go ahead. Over and over, one time to over 500 people, Jesus was there. I don't believe a vision, a ghost. I don't believe any of that. I believe it was the bodily form of Jesus Christ that once was dead but is now alive. These appearances of Jesus that we have recorded in the Bible, and, and there's 12 of them, 12 different individual groups of people saw this Jesus alive. I would say to you that it is great for us to study the life of Jesus. And it is great for us to study the death of Jesus. And it is great for us to study the burial of Jesus. And it is great for us to study the resurrected Jesus. But I don't want us to do it just at Easter. I want, I want for you and for me to take this resurrected Lord. I want him to take him with us into the, the end of April and, and into May and June and July and August. I, I want us to, to, to keep this idea that, hey, the resurrected Jesus is alive. That that tomb is empty. I want us to think about Jesus' appearances today. And then I want to draw to a close in a few moments about how you and I have the responsibility to keep it going. To keep this story going. That you and I have the responsibility to make sure that the world, beginning in Longview, Texas, knows that Jesus is alive. It beckons me to ask and answer three questions today about the appearances of Jesus. Three questions about this and, and, and the other 11 stories, the eyewitness. We don't have video of it. We don't. Some of you are going to go and Google uh, a video of a guy getting hit by a mattress this afternoon. And you're going to do the same thing I did. You're just going to hit replay, replay, replay. We don't have a video, but I'm convinced you have an eyewitness account in your life. I'm convinced of that. If you don't, I want you to have one today. Let's ask and answer three questions. Let's ask the first question is this. Let's ask, why did Jesus come back to life? Why, why, did he, why was he resurrected? Why did he come back to life? I mean, it, we, we know why he lived, and we know what he did when he was alive. We, we know, we know that, that, that he lived that perfect life. Why did he come back to life? Why did he just not die? I shook the hand this past week in Providence Hospital in uh, Waco, Texas, of a World War II veteran. I walked, he was wearing his hat. I chased him down. And I tapped him on the shoulder, and I said, Sir, can I shake your hand? And he turned around and had a big smile on his face. And I, I do like I always do when I meet someone that's wearing a Vietnam cap or a Korean cap or a World War II. And very few of you even have the chance to shake some hands of World War I veterans. I said, sir, can you tell me your story? And he said, son, I don't have any stories, but I'll tell you some stories about some heroes. And he told me about some of his friends that gave their life for our country. And he called them Heroes. Because they died for a noble cause. Well, and, and I agree 100% that, that there are those that have died for a noble cause. And if all we knew of Jesus was that he died, it would be safe to say he died for a noble cause because he did a lot of good while he was here. He changed the lives of a lot of people while he was here on earth. But we know that there's more than that. 
So why did he come back to life? Let me give you two reasons. There's probably a multitude of reasons. But I focused on these two this past week. One, I believe that he came back to life to give us confidence of something called eternal life. To give us confidence that there is life after this life. A good friend of mine is named Jeff Carroll. Jeff Carroll and I served together a couple of years ago at First Baptist Rusk. Uh, Kim and I was able to, to be with their family when they found out that one of their children, one of their children, while serving on a, on a, a missionary ship called Mercy Ship, while he was playing with some kids that he had helped, swimming just off the, the coast of Liberia, was caught in an undertow and was pulled out to, to sea and died. And Kim and I were able to be with him during that time. And, and Jeff and his wife Sandy, they speak often of heaven, of this eternal life. And they usually do it with a smile on their face because they know that their son, Colin Carroll, is in heaven. This past week, Jeff posted something on Facebook. And he was quoting Randy Alcorn, who writes a lot about heaven. I've read everything he's got. He's quoting him. He says, since in heaven we will finally experience life at, it, at its best, wouldn't it be more accurate to call our present time here just existence or maybe before life rather than to call what follows it after life? Because if we start to live after life with Jesus, we're living real life. You see, Jesus, I believe with all my heart, came and, and died and rose again to give us confidence that there is life after this present situation. I, I believe he did it to show these disciples that, hey, what we've been doing together for the last three years is because there is something after this. The tomb, death, is not the end for those that know Christ. That's when life begins. We call it afterlife here. It's really real life. I, did, I, I believe with all my heart, Jesus came to give us confidence that there's, there's more than what we have right here. And I'll be honest with you. Right now, I'm glad there's more than what we have right here. I'm glad that there is such a thing as eternal life. I believe he came and died and rose again to give us confidence of eternal life. But I believe, secondly, he did it all to give us courage in this life. Courage. That song we sang a while ago, in the good times and bad, you were on your throne. We wouldn't be able to sing that if all we had was the death of Jesus. We would gather together and say it was a noble cause that Jesus died. He died to help all of those people that he healed, that he helped, that he fed. Jesus died for, for just them. And it was a noble cause. And we would have no courage when we go through difficult times here. But because we have a resurrected Lord, one that did not stay dead, one that on that third day left that tomb, we can have courage that even if the worst thing that happens to us here is death, the best follows. And we can have courage for that. Have you ever heard of Robert Lowry? Not Fred Lowry, pastor over in Shreveport, but Robert Hymnal right here. You may not have, but in, in this hymnal right here, that, by the way, you... If you want one of these hymnals, these have been the hymnals at Calvary Baptist Church for a long time. They are. We've had a family within our church that has bought us new hymnals. And, and, and here's what Kim and I are doing. We're going to buy some of these. There's others that are going to buy some of these. If you'd like to $5 donation, you can have one. Because it's a part of who we are. It is. It's a part of, of what has, has, has made us who we are. You can buy one if you'd like to, and it'll help tell others about Jesus. In, in this hymnal right here, 
in this hymnal. These words exist. Written by Robert Lowry. Low in the grave he lay, Jesus, my Savior. Waiting the coming day, Jesus, my Lord. Vainly they watched his bed, Jesus, my Savior. Vainly they sealed the dead, Jesus, my Lord. Death cannot keep his prey, Jesus, my Savior. He tore the bars away, Jesus, my Lord. You know what the course is? Up from the grave, he arose. Uh, with a mighty triumph o'er his foes, he arose a victor from the dark domain, and he lives, how long? With his saints to reign. He arose, he arose. Hallelujah, Christ arose. Listen to me. He appeared to those people to tell them it's not the end. That death had no sting. Jesus Christ is alive. It, it beckons me, though, to ask a second question. Not why did he rise, but why did he have to show himself? Why is that important? Why, why did Jesus show himself alive? I mean, we know the grave and that empty tomb. I tried to find it this past week. I've never visited uh, Israel. I was wearing the uniform of the, the United States military when I was in that part of the world. I wasn't visiting there. <laughs> I want to go back and visit sometime. But I tried to Google and and find the grave, and I was able to, I think, find where, where it's held by, by wide belief that that's where Jesus died. We know about the tomb. We know about the stone. But why in the world did he have to show himself alive? Why is that important? I, I thought of these three reasons. One, I think he had to show himself alive to those ladies and to all the others to provide proof that he wasn't dead anymore. To provide proof, because we need proof, friends. M most of us are, are not from Missouri, but we do live by the Missouri motto. They are known as the show me state. Most of us, when we hear something, somebody tells me they catch a 10-pound fish, what do I say? Show me. I want to see a picture. That's, that's, that's what... We live by that. And I think if, if Jesus would have just came back to life and didn't show anybody, and the disciples just started saying, hey, Jesus is alive. These ladies, Jesus is alive. It, if there was no proof, I honestly don't believe Christianity would be in existence today. I certainly don't think it would be the force that it is. Because we need proof. We, we have to know that that's what happened. And I think that's why it's not just a one. I think that's why there's, there, there's, there's 12 different times when, when Jesus showed himself alive. Because we need proof. You know, there were many that, that were saying at that time that the disciples stole Jesus' body so they could say that he was alive. That the disciples are the ones that snuck in that tomb and and took his, took his body. I think that's one of the reasons Jesus appeared one time to over 500 people. Where there was a large group that said, we saw him. I heard him speak. These ladies, I grabbed his feet. I tell you, he's a lot. We needed proof. You and I need proof too. I'll come back to that one. Secondly, I think he showed himself to provide peace. Peace. That that. In the good times and the bad, he is still on his throne. Uh, peace. I met with a group of guys this morning very, very early, and, and they prayed for me. And one of the things I told them was that uh, to be. when you all pray for me, I said, it just kind of brings that plumb bob right back to the middle where it's supposed to be. It kind of sets everything right back in motion. And Brother Dick says, yeah, it's, it, it gives you a peace, 
a peace that passes all understanding. If all we had was just Jesus' death, I don't think there would be peace. I don't think, I don't think honestly, I don't think when I heard that my mom and dad were involved in a serious accident that, and that there was a chance they could die, I don't think without the resurrected Lord I would have peace. I've got a grandfather and, and a grandmother and a grandfather and a grandmother that I long to see who helped raise me. I spent time in their house. I ate their food. I lived with them. I longed to see them. I don't think I would, I don't think I would have the peace to know that one of these days I'm going to see them again without the resurrected Lord. I don't think I could face death. I don't think I could stand with someone that is about to die and offer words of encouragement and peace and comfort if but for the resurrected Lord. If all I could say was, well, Jesus died too. There's no peace in that, friend. But I can say that there's eternal life. There's life after this life, and it's real life. It's the kind of life that Jesus spoke about in John 10, 10 when he said, I've come that you could have life, and you can have it more abundantly. I think that's what Jesus was talking about. He did it to provide peace. And, and I think he did it Number three, to provide purpose. Purpose. These disciples, hey, they needed some direction. Because everything that they lived for the last three years was gone. It was all in the form of a person, Jesus Christ. He took them from all of their occupations, and he called them, and he said, follow me, and I'll make you fishers of men. And they fished for men for three years. Then their world got turned upside down. One of the appearances for me that's kind of special is in John 21. You don't have to turn there. Go back and read John 21 sometime because it is a beautiful, beautiful story of one of the appearances of Jesus. They're all sitting together and they need something. I mean, Jesus is, he's dead and, and, and their he life has changed. And Peter, Peter looks at the other disciples sitting there and he said, Guys, I'm going fishing. And they all go, man, that sounds like a good idea. Let's go. So they all take off. They go get in the boat. John 21 is a great story. They go get in the boat. They fish all night. They don't have anything. They don't catch a fish. Any good fisherman would lie and say that he had a bunch of bites. But they hadn't caught a single thing. And a guy from shore hollers out at them and says, y'all caught anything? Any good fisherman would have lied and said, yeah, man, we've had a great time. But they're pretty honest. They said they hadn't caught a single fish. And the guy on the bank says, hey, cast on the other side. You're casting on the wrong side of the boat. And they go, oh, okay. And so they cast on the other side. And the Bible says that the net had so many fish in it that they couldn't even pull it in. They, they couldn't. They started heading towards shore. And Pete, uh, John looks and he recognizes the guy that they've been talking to. And he goes, that's Jesus, guys. And Peter, this doesn't make any sense at all. This does not make any sense. Check this out. Peter, who took his coat off to bring those fish in, out there in the water when they caught it, the Bible tells us in John 21 that Peter put his coat back on and jumped in the water. That makes no sense. You don't do that. If somebody's drowning and you're going to go in and get them, you take some outer clothes off and then you go in. Peter puts his coat back on and he jumps in. And he swims to shore. It is Jesus. And, and that, that number of fish, is, I think this is cool. They tell us that it's 153 fish. I think that's pretty cool. I mean, if they just know the number exactly. And Jesus takes some of them. He builds a fire. A ghost can't build a fire, friend. He, he, he gets some of those fish. They fillet them out. He puts them on there. And he eats with the disciples. He, they, they break bread together and they eat fish together. And that's when Jesus said, Peter, do you love me? 
And Peter said, Lord, you know I love you. And he said, feed my sheep. And then he looked back at Peter again. He said, Peter, do you really love me? John 21, go read it this afternoon. It's a great story. Peter says, Lord, you know I love you. Jesus said, go feed my, my sheep. And then a third time, Jesus was famous for this kind of stuff. He looks right at Peter's heart. And he said, Peter, do you really love me? And Peter said, Lord, you know all things. You know I love you. He said, go feed my sheep. And you know what Peter began to do? Feed sheep. And you know what the ones that came after Peter did? Fed sheep. And you know what people have been doing for 2,000 years? Feeding sheep. Telling this story of the resurrected Lord. And I would say to you that if we don't tell others, if we skip a single generation, I believe this with all my heart, so I stake my life on it. We skip a generation, Christianity will not be what it is right now. And Christianity and the belief that there's a resurrected Lord will die if we don't tell somebody. So it, it, it beckons us to ask a third question, and I'm almost through. That question would be, then what does this resurrected Jesus want from me? What does this resurrected Jesus, if you believe, and I'm, I'm just assuming, I guess I shouldn't do that. I guess I ask, I need to ask. If you believe Jesus is alive, if you believe these stories of his appearing, that, that those ladies actually grabbed real feet and not a ghost, if you believe that, I guess, just raise your hand, please. Hands up everywhere. All right. Then what does that person that you believed was raised from the dead, what does he want from me? What does he want from you? If he came back to life, there had to be a reason. If he appeared to them, there had to be a reason. If he allowed us somewhere down the road to hear this story, there has to be a reason. So watch the reason. What does the resurrected Jesus want from you? What does he want from me? Three things. One, he wants, he wants me to know him, to know who he is. Not just know about him. I know a lot about a lot of people. I do. I read a lot. I follow a lot. I know a lot about a lot of people. There's more than just knowing about Jesus. I'm, I'm convinced of this, guys. And hear me from, from a pastor's heart. I think there's some even in here today that know about Jesus. But I don't think the resurrected Lord wants you to just know about him. I think the resurrected Lord wants you to know him. The one that, that did die and was buried but rose again. He doesn't want you just to know about him. He wants you to know him. Not just believe the stories about him, but to trust him with eternal life. Would you in your mind for just a second, think back to when you said to Jesus, I believe you. I believe you're God's son. I believe you died on a cross for me. Come into my life. Make me a Christian. Your salvation prayer might not have gone exactly like that, but when did you stop just knowing about Jesus and began to know him personally? When was that for you? I gave away several dollars this past week, Trey, thank you, in the hospital. Because I go on the elevator a lot. And, and you can say what you want to. It, it, it pays to be on an elevator with Donnie Barron. Because <laughs> when you get on an elevator with Donnie Barron, you're going to earn a quarter. You're going to get one. I don't care who you are. You can be another preacher and you'll get one. I gave one to, to, to one of the Catholic priests from Longview this past week. I said, dude, I need to give you a quarter. And I shared my testimony. Hey, for me, it was 1972. I don't remember everything about it. I don't. But here's what I remember. I stopped knowing 
about Jesus in 1972. And I started knowing Jesus in 1972. Big difference. So when was the difference for you? If today you're here and all it is that you know about Jesus, you've never invited him into your heart personally. You never invited him to come in and live in your heart. That's what he wants to do. The Bible tells us that he stands at the door and knocks. He wants to come in. He wants you to know more than just about him. So when was it for you? Friend, if you're here today and you just know about him, today is your blessed day. Today is your day of salvation. Today is the day that you can invite Jesus Christ into your heart. That's what Jesus wants you to do. A dead man, if Jesus just died, he can't want anything. Dead man can't want anything from you. But a man that's alive can want your life so that he can give you real life. So what does Jesus want from us, this resurrected Lord? It is to, to know him. Secondly, I think it's, it's, it's just like, and all three of these end in O-W. It's easy for me to remember. He wants us to follow him. That's what he told all these disciples. Every one of them that came to him said, hey, what's the deal about you? And he said, well, come on, follow me and you'll find out. One of my favorite parts of the cantata last week was Chuck's, Chuck's testimony when Chuck was one of the, the, the disciples. And he said, my brother, you remember, you remember his testimony last week? Well, my brother said that I need to meet this guy named Jesus. And when I did, what did he say? Chuck, what did he tell you to do? Follow him. I, here's what I believe. I can't, I can't follow a dead man, a dead man. Is dead. But I can follow someone that's alive. I know the risen Savior. He's in the world today, the song says. I know that he is with me no matter what they say. He's alive. So are you following Jesus? I think that would be the second thing that we would have to wrestle with. Are we following him? Do I know him? And if you answer yes to that, that am I following him? Am I looking like him? Am I playing follow the leader? You played that game as a child, hadn't you? You follow the leader. What do you do? You do exactly the same thing. Uh, I followed the leader this week 20 times. And my leader was a four-year-old, almost four-year-old, little blonde-haired, blue-eyed girl walking around the hospital saying, gee, daddy, follow me. Get in line. And we walked all over that hospital. She not knowing where she was going, me losing where we were going, but I was just doing what I was told. I was following her. Hey, listen, a dead man can't tell you to follow him, but a man that's alive can. Are you following Jesus? Does your life look like him? One other thing I think that this resurrected Lord asks of us, and it would be that we show him. Know him, that ends in O-W. Follow, that ends in O-W. And show that, that he, I wouldn't be a good, show him. Hey, I need to show y'all something. And I, I wouldn't be a good G daddy if I didn't show you something. Look at the screen and I need to show you the latest addition to the Barron family. That is Tucker Wayne, uh, named after me, Barron. He was born this last Friday about 6.30 at night and and let me tell you something, I'm still floating around. Is that not the best looking kid you've ever seen? <laughs> I'm not biased, am I? Hey, and, and, and this is his big sister, the one that I was playing follow the leader with. That's her. And, and now I showed you that because I've done it with all of my, my grandchildren. Every time one of them has been born, I've had an opportunity to do that. But, but that gives you the right, if you're a parent or a grandparent, to come up to me and say, let me show you a picture now. And I'm going to smile, and I'm going to say, it's the cutest kid. Yes, I am. I'm going to do the same thing that you're doing to me. Because that's what we do. When someone's important to you, like my grandchildren are important to me, you show them off. That picture is leaving now. And I'm just talking to you and me. 
Is the resurrected Lord important enough to us to show him? To show him off? To talk about him? To tell people that we believe in him? To tell him that he is one alive? He's alive. We, we worship a risen Savior. Jesus didn't die again last Sunday. We celebrated the resurrected Lord on Easter Sunday, and then we called it Resurrection Sunday. This is Resurrection Sunday, too. And next Sunday will be, and next Sunday. He's alive. Number two, he's the answer. He's the answer. Uh, listen, we need to tell people that Jesus is the answer that they're looking for. I'm thankful that I had a mom that in 1972 said, Donnie, the answer is Jesus. And I've been believing it ever since. And I've been telling people about him ever since. That he's alive. That he's the answer. That he is available. Show people Jesus this week. Show, well, I, no, I don't have a picture. And, and no, I don't have a video on my phone of Jesus. I've got one of my grandbaby. If you're interested, catch me at the back. I'll show it to you. But I've got a picture of him in my heart. In my life, my life ought to look like Jesus's. When, when, when people see me, when people see you, they ought to see Jesus. You know, we say on Easter Sunday, boy, you look good. And you wear a new shirt and a new tie, whatever you wore. I don't know. You may have not have worn anything new. I don't think I wore. I had a new shirt last week. I did. Old tie, new shirt. I'm wearing a tie from another Easter on purpose this morning because I... It's an Easter tie. I'm not real comfortable in polka dots. <laughs> but she said it matched. And so I came, hey, I, we look our best when we come here. Y'all know my policy. We don't come here and put on a mask like everything's good. We come here real. Admitting when we walk in those doors that I need a resurrected Lord in my life. I don't have all the answers, but he is. And he is the way that I'll be alive after this life. And he is available every Sunday of the year, every day of the year, every moment of every day. You do know what the Bible says, don't you? The Bible says I'll never, what, leave you nor? Hey, just let him do that. Show and tell. Take him with you when you leave here and show him off. You remember show and tell? You remember show and tell? I've got a grandfather that's in heaven right now that served in World War II. And I've got a grenade that he brought back. Now, in 1972, you could take a grenade to school and get away with it. <laughs> and I did. It's disarmed. But in 1972, I was in the second grade. And I, I, I took one of the grenades that he brought back. And I took it to show and tell. And I talked about this with my grandfathers. And I walked up and down the hallways with a grenade. <laughs> Honest, Eastland, Texas. I walked the birthplace of Old Rip, the, the oldest horny toad in the world. I'm walking around the school with a hand grenade. I still got that hand grenade. I've got something much more important that people need to know about. So do you, friend. A while ago, you raised your hand, but you believed it. You did. I watched. Now let's go tell somebody. I challenge you. Simple. Here's my challenge. Tell somebody about the resurrected Lord this week. Let me pray for us.